Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for attending today and happy International Women's Day to everyone. So um, I'm just going to go over some. I'm going to go over some quick housekeeping rules. Um, this this uh, panel will be recorded today and we ask you to direct all of the questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. And we promote friendly dialogue in the chat feature. And then of course, this event wouldn't be possible without our sponsors and supporters. So I wanna do a quick thank you to our DEI champions, Air Products, Capital Blue Cross, Dust Born, Keystone Cannon Remedies, and Olympus. And also a special thank you to our bronze sponsor, Crayola. I wanna, so thank you all for supporting us and supporting this mission and International Women's Day. So to kick off today's event, I'm gonna give it to Genesis Ortega from PBS 39, Lehigh Valley Public Media. Welcome Genesis and thank you for moderating today. Oop. We can't hear you, Genesis. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yep, now we can. <laughs> Hi everybody, happy International Women's Day. I'm super excited to be moderating this panel. I do think it's gonna be a wonderful be a conversation. Wonderful. So thanks for joining us and listening. Uh, I'm going to start with around the panel introductions. Uh, full biographies are in the program for today, but so that we get a sense of who everyone is, I'm just going to ask the panel to give a 30 second introduction of who they are and what they do. So Lindsay, why don't you kick us off and after her, Jasmine, Damalisa, third, and then Zeb. Okay, take it away, Lindsay. Hi everyone, happy International Women's Day. My name is Lindsay Watson. I am a resident of Lehigh Valley and co-founder co of FIA NYC Employment Services. We are an Allentown-based staffing agency and we've been in Lehigh Valley for over, not, no, over eight years now. Uh, and I'm also principal of Joy Fluent, uh, which is a virtual business support services business, also headquartered here in Lehigh Valley. Excited to be here. And good afternoon, everyone, and happy Women's International Women's Day to all the ladies that are tuning in. My name is Jasmine Fleming. I am a esthetician and salon owner of the Skintiful House of Glam and Day Spa here in the Lehigh Valley area. Um, I've been established for four years, brick and mortar, six years um, as an LLC, and I'm very excited to share all of my challenges and overcoming my challenges with you today to give you ladies some empowerment. Hi, I'm Deb Clay Alston, and again, happy International Women's Day. I'm really excited to be part of this uh, panel today. Uh, I am a sales executive at ADP. Um, ADP is the largest commercial investment in downtown Allentown, so I'm really excited about that. Um, I also participate in a lot of DE&I initiatives um, with my organization at ADP, as well as Muhlenberg College. I do a lot of volunteer work. And I'm excited to uh, help uh, talk about um, things that are important to women today. Hi everyone, my name is Yamalisa Taveras. I am a resident of Allentown and um, I am excited to be here. So happy Women's um, you know, Month and especially today. Uh, I am the founder of the Unidos Foundation, locally here in the Lehigh Valley, as well as um, over 14 years of experience as a behaviorist in the substance use world. I'm working in both uh, private sectors, uh, public and nonprofit sectors, helping the community in different ways. So I identify myself as a philanthropist, um, as well as a community servant. Um, so I am excited to be here and thank you. Wonderful. We really do have a great panel for talented and accomplished women with very different life experiences, which is what makes us us, right? As women, we're great. And I'll echo what Azalea said. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Nothing is off the table today. So let's get started. I want to remind everyone that the theme of this discussion centers around achieving an equal future in a COVID-19 world. And so the question in everyone's mind should be, how do we achieve that and make sure that both men and women are on equal playing fields moving past the pandemic and into the new reality that awaits us when all is said and done? So that being said, I will start with you, Deb. In this new COVID-19 world, everything is virtual. Zoom meetings are now the norm and face-to-face -face communication for the most part is non-existent for the time being. 
female body language or the nonverbal ways that we used to communicate are no more. So how do you recommend navigating work and professional relationships despite this? Okay, um, thank you. Um, I believe that we need to embrace our new norm. Um, I always like to remind people that change is a constant. And so we are continuing to look to up our game and also to just to improve upon the present. So we need to take this challenge in stride and really look at it from a different angle. And sure, we all hate not being able to meet in person and mingle and things like that. But, um, you know, we just have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And the expectations should not change just because we're virtual. While I believe, you know, the face-to-face -face, uh, communication is non-existent, it really isn't. It's just that technology is now allowing us to have face-to-face -face communication um, through that way. But, um, you know, what you need to do is you have to leverage that technology to create that uh, connectivity. And so we need to make sure that, you know, we put a solid plan in place. Like we still have to be prepared when we go into those situations. And, you know, what is our agenda? Um, what, what, are we, um, what are we looking to solve for? And make sure that those sessions are engaging. Um, that is so important that just because we're on a camera doesn't mean we can't be engaging. We should leverage the chat sessions. We should look for opportunities to really get involved. And so it's just that, you know, from a professional, if a client facing perspective, it's important that you really set a solid agenda, but you can also use those on personal uh, level as well from a networking standpoint, like look and see where there's webinars. I mean, everybody has really had to take this to a different level. So look to see where there are webinars and you can have those conversations with folks. And then during those webinars, when you leverage the chat feature, then what you should really be doing is looking for opportunities to say, hey, I love that discussion. Can we have some further discussion around this? So again, we shouldn't look at it as a barrier, but we should embrace it and say, how do we do it differently? We just have to really be really creative in our new norm today. You know, it's no secret that coronavirus has disproportionately impacted many people, women included. Um, and so data from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics shows that women are the hardest hit by pandemic joblessness. Women of color um, are even hit, hit more. Um, and so there are numerous reasons for this, but let's hone in on the work-life balance pressure. There's a need to be caretakers, educators, chefs, maids, you name it. Um, we really do it all. So Jamalisa, this question is for you. Um, as a woman, how do you balance your family life with the demands of your profession and your business? So I know we're supposed to come in here as these like professional panelists that have all the right answers. I don't, and um, I'm sure many of us do not. The reality is it's very difficult. Um, I can speak for myself just through the pandemic. I mean, I'm bringing up a brand new business um, to provide counseling in the area. I have a nonprofit that is, again, just coming up. So it's very difficult. And I'm also a mom of four. I have two little ones still in the home. And the balancing act, I mean, Deb touched on it, is the importance of an agenda. You just have to keep track of your time. I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult. But the reality is, is it's okay to take a break. It's okay to self-care and it's okay to ask for help. Um, that is something that our society always tells us like, no, how dare you? Because then it makes you a bad mother, a bad employee, a bad whatever it is. All of those judgments upon women, it just makes it very, very difficult. So we need to embrace the fact that we cannot do it alone. We are, we, we are brought up in this society as if we're supposed to live in silos. It's impossible. Let's be realistic. You know, our nature is to live in villages and to support one another. So we need to take that back on. We need to really do that more. We need to learn that it is okay to some days rest. It is okay for some days to do self-care. And it is okay sometimes to give the kids off and let dad take care of them or, or you know, second mom or grandma or whomever you have. It is okay to take a break. It is okay to do less. And we just have to learn to, to support one another and uplift that and respect the way that other mothers and other women, not only mothers, but other women live their lives and balance work, life, home, and whatever partakes. So yeah, it's, it's hard. I don't have all the answers, but that's what I can share. Lindsay, I see you shaking your head in agreement. You want to expand on that? Maybe from a different perspective, but you know, it's funny. I'm taking notes 
and I know I'm on the panel, but I always believe if I'm on a panel, then there are other folks who have experienced things differently from me and I can learn from them. So I'm taking notes as, as we talk. Two things, one, I 100% agree with Yamalisa. I am so thankful for my tribe, my friends that I have. I've had to really reach out to them um, even before we were all impacted by COVID-19. I was going through a time of, of soul searching myself and realized that I needed people to talk to, to get advice from, sometimes just to call and vent. And in my venting, I would end up sorting out the answers just by being able to have a safe space to talk. So I don't always need my tribe to have all of the answers and solutions for me. Sometimes they do, but sometimes I just need a safe space to be able to kind of share and release. Uh, and then that different perspective, I'm an auntie and a godmother. No kids yet, but those are my babies and I love them. And so I was smiling because absolutely, second mom, auntie, whatever, we're here. And I know everyone probably listening has an auntie in their circle who can help out and would be happy to do so. We love that when you call and ask us to help. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Could be a neighbor or whatever, you know, auntie title can be used for, for different types of folks. But um, yeah, that's what made me smile because I love having a tribe and I love being a part of a tribe. I love being able to say, Hey, I got you covered, even if it's for a few hours or a day. You know, that, that brings fulfillment, even being at home. Uh, what you both said is very relatable. You know, as I think as well, I'm like, I have, you know, three best friends who I call auntie to, you know, my one-year-old um, who are always helping me because I don't have sisters. So it is really important to have that support system. Um, you know, a very fast growing number is that of female entrepreneurs. 36% of all small businesses are held by women, and almost 60% of the largest female-owned businesses started from scratch. I see you clapping, Jamalisa. That's great. Um, and those numbers will only continue to get higher. So Jasmine, let me ask you, as a small business owner yourself, what word of advice can you give to other women who are prospective entrepreneurs and are looking to make the jump? And moving past that, did your successful career just happen, or did you have a plan in place? Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say you have to plan your dive before you dive your plan. And I learned that from my years of tenure being in corporate America, just being in sales, that to be successful, uh, you don't have to have every answer of how to get your business started, but you should definitely have the fun fundamentals. And like Ms. Deb said, and all of us ladies are saying today, it takes a tribe. You have to reach out. You have to network. Um, be Skintiful started in my sleep, in my dream. It started out on pen and paper with visionary boards. It started out with me reaching out and looking up what it started to take to open up a brick and mortar in the state of Pennsylvania and my local, you know, municipalities and work reaching out to other entrepreneurs and asking them for help and how did they get started and and through that you start to build this home you start to build your 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 bricks and your foundation to finally open and expand whatever your passion is so i would definitely say um, yes, it may be challenging at first, but nothing in life is worth, is, nothing in life is worth, you know, everything in life is worth, uh, is worth, worth uh, fighting for, excuse me. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I really believe that us women, we can definitely do it all. Uh, I think it's just starting out with just branching out, writing a plan and sticking to that plan. And if you have any needed help or not help, there are a lot of great free resources. Um, and I'm open to being a mentor and a, and a, a consultant to anyone for free that is looking forward to starting um, their own. I, I think I have a lot of good experiences and challenges that I think other women, um, I would like to share with other women to be their own entrepreneur successfully. I don't want to speak for all business owners, but I believe the pandemic has made things more challenging um, as a business owner. So let me ask you this as a follow-up question. How can business owners connect with clients, old clients, and new clients in this new virtual world? Oh my goodness. Um, there are so many uh, avenues. Uh, social media platforms have helped tremendously for my business. Um, email marketing, if you have a list of people or friends and, um, you know, 
potential clients that you can stay in touch with and just let them know like, hey, I'm still here. I want you to know that I want to connect with you. Uh, it definitely has helped me especially when we were during the pandemic where we were quarantined in our business, the salon uh, couldn't be open. But I still took the time to make sure I still stay relevant on my social media posting, just letting everyone know, you know, stay safe, giving them skincare tips at home. So they will feel like, you know, even though they're away from a, you know, a physical presence, we're virtually still being connected with sharing tips about, you know, what my business stands for and, and that's self-care. So I wanted to make sure even during these challenges that we're experiencing, I still gave the public and our followers that, that connection with us. And um, some of me and my girls, we even did little live videos, you know, telling um, our, our followers and our clients, you know, what we did and what we're looking forward to do once we're back in, in our uh, the salon space. And that did a lot of help um, once we were open. I mean, the floodgates came back. Every woman was looking forward to getting out and getting their nails done after six months of not being able to pamper themselves. So I would just say stay connected. Virtually, that is your, that's our avenue with technology. So if you keep that in the forefront, uh, I think it, it, it would definitely be befitting for the longevity of your business. Let's talk stereotypes for a moment. According to the Harvard Business School, researchers believe gender stereotypes hold women back in the workplace and can even cause women to question their own abilities. We see this play out in corporate America a lot where we know women make up more than half of the labor force, almost 60% hold advanced degrees, and yet they bring home less pay and don't hold leadership positions in proportionate numbers to men. So let me ask you this, Lindsay, let's talk about the root of this, confidence and knowing your worth. How can women work to see their value? Thank you, Genesis. It's a great question. And just so you all know, I usually answer her questions through storytelling. That's how I communicate. So just tell you a quick story. Uh, about two years ago, I had to do some soul searching myself. Now, I've, I've had over 15 years of experience in staffing and recruiting and found myself at a point wondering what my value was. What had I accomplished? I worked on Wall Street for a long time and then transitioned into entrepreneurship. And it was very difficult to actually intentionally pause as a business owner and stop and assess what had actually been done. And uh, as painful and as tough as it was, what I realized is it wasn't even for me. I did my soul searching and some stuff happened, which was great. But then all of a sudden, women started coming to me saying, okay, I want to transition. I want to do this and that, but I don't know how to represent myself well. And what I learned in my own process is that we have to stop and intentionally pause and assess. But without structure, pausing and assessing could just be a whole bunch of overthinking. And so through my staffing and recruiting experience, um, I was able to come up with a process of working with anyone, specifically for women, to really focus on what they've made, saved, achieved, and what they remember that they've done accomplishment-wise for all of their previous positions or even in the businesses that they're owning currently. And being able to have that process and analyze information transfers into something that is quantifiable that you can actually see, right? You can put it on a document, you can write it out, you can say, hey, wow, 50% increase in new customer acquisition from last year to this year, that's pretty cool. Or wow, I did bring in all those clients organically. Whatever, whatever it is, being able to see what you've done and quantify it gives you confidence to now be able to learn how to communicate that to others. So when it comes to value, one, I, I never look at statistics myself. I am not a statistic, right? What I like to focus on is how can I help the person that I'm working with or working for? And how can I help the other people who are coming in behind me? But how can I communicate well enough what my value is so that those doors can be open, right? And so when you look at finding a way to quantify your history and keeping it, first and foremost, you gotta be able to accept it and, and learn how to communicate it. But second, from there, once you begin to move forward to that next position or next opportunity, last thing I'll say, you have more confidence that if you get a no, you'll know that you're getting that yes around the corner because you understand what your value is. And so through my own journey, I've just learned, wow, you know what? It's not that difficult to figure out what I have to offer, but there needs to be a process and a structure in place for me to be able to 
see it, put it together, and then see it realized. I hope that makes sense. It does, you know, but let me let me just ask you a follow-up question here because I feel like I can look in the mirror and I can say, you got this mama, you know, you're rocking it as much as I want. But if I walk into a room um, and I feel like, you know, I can suffer from an inferior complex, just at the slightest thing, um, you know, so how do we move past like those butterflies in your stomach, your sweaty palms, like all of those feelings that come up? Yeah, it's a great question. I was nervous all day up until this panel, y'all. I'm still sitting here like, man, I haven't eaten a meal. I had half a banana, okay? But I show up and I have been showing up for over 15 years, most of the time unprepared, not knowing what, but the only way that I could find out if I could do it or not was by being present. And I showed up. I moved here from the New York City area you know, at the, the leadership and guidance of my business partner, Bill Brown, who you guys know, I talk about him so much. We moved to Allentown when the PPL Center was a hole in the ground, right? They, I never thought I'd be living here, but I, you know, I sit with it, I pray on it, and then I show up. I don't overthink. And even if I feel nervous, I'll feel nervous on my way. But once I get there, it's either gonna be good or it's not, but it's gonna be experience I can add to my belt. So what I would suggest is show up, be present, network. As Deb was talking about, let's make the most of technology. Practice networking if you want. Reach out to a few people on LinkedIn that you looked up to and say, man, I wonder if you'd actually talk to me. You know, Look at where you wanna build and be present and show up. I have no magic pill or no magic formula for there to be peace and no nerves leading up to it. If y'all have one, let me know. But I'm just, it, it, sometimes I say I'm, I'm foolish enough to just keep trying. You know, I don't even know if that's helpful or not, but I will tell you by me being present, last thing I'll say, I have more access to opportunity by continually showing up than others who may choose not to give themselves that chance. And that's really what we're talking about. We need to value ourselves enough to give ourselves the chance. You know, win, win or lose, it's an experience. And at some point the break happens for us. It does. It is helpful. So on that note, value. Uh, let's talk about performance reviews. How many of you just had flashbacks when I said those words? Um, for some performance reviews are a great experience, for others not so much, um, and can actually be a big source of workplace anxiety. Um, in a study of performance reviews, 66% of women say they received negative feedback on their personal style with comments such as, you can sometimes be abrasive. And that's compared to only 1% of men who say they received the same type of feedback. That's research from leanin.org. Um, so Deborah, let me ask you, how do you recommend navigating performance reviews? I know that we have audience members from a wide range of professions, so I'll ask you to address it from both sides. How do you suggest handling as a supervisor? And on the flip side of that, how do you recommend the employee handle receiving negative feedback? Um, great question. And I would say, yes, I've been one of those folks who has uh, re been coached several times on my approach. And so, um, and it's okay. It's okay. But, you know, I'm very passionate about my work and I believe that, you know, um, everybody has an opportunity to be a top performer. They need to understand the expectations. They, they need to know what they need to do to be, um, to be successful. And, to also um, get the support that they need. But, you know, when you do have a performance evaluation, I have to tell you, like where I work now, we don't get performance evaluations. And this is my second career. And that was just so odd to me. You know, when you work in sales, your report card is, is really like what you're bringing in from a sales perspective. However, um, you know, I think it's important as a supervisor, when I give a performance evaluation, it should not be the first time that that person is getting that feedback. That should be an ongoing conversation. You should be having one-on-one -on -one discussions with your team and making sure that you know, you're know you talking about what's going on, what the expectation is, and that you are praising them when they're doing a really great job, but your job is also to make sure you're providing uh, constructive feedback to them. So um, you know that's really important. Like I said, it, you should, it should never be a first time that they receive that feedback in a performance evaluation. But as a person that receives feedback, I think it's important that you thank the person for feedback that they're giving you. I mean, because that's how we grow. 
and it's from their perspective, but that's their perspective and that's the reality. And so you need to address that. And, you know, the way that I've done it in the past is I thank the person for the feedback. Thank you so much for the feedback. And then I would ask for their advice on, you know, how they may have seen it differently or how they may approach it. And then based on that, and then I would ask for some examples also, but it's also important for me to make sure that I follow up with that person just to kind of say, hey, you know, I took your feedback, I'm going to try to incorporate it uh, and find out, you know, how I'm doing, like, am I still, you know, exhibiting X, you know, behavior or whatever. But I also think it's important for me as a woman to also explain maybe why I took a certain approach to something. So if I, if I have been abrasive in any situation, you know, this is what my intent was, and this is what I was looking to do. And again, gather feedback. But I think it's important when you talk about situations like this, it's all around communication and there has to be dialogue back and forth. It has to be two way. It's never a one way conversation. And so when you engage in those conversations and you ask someone, hey, do you mind if I give you some feedback? I think it's going to open up the conversation and they're going to be more receptive. And now, you know, together you can put together a plan. So bottom line, what I'm saying here, it's all around communication and making sure you have that open dialogue. We should all want feedback because we want to grow and move to the next level. I'm going to take a break here and I'm going to address uh, some of the comments and questions that are in the chat. Um, Anita has a follow-up question for you, Deb. She says, I have a coworker who doesn't take feedback as an opportunity to make changes. How can this be addressed? a coworker that doesn't take opportunity. Um, I think that, um, you know, when you have a coworker, I think it's important um, when you have dialogue that you sit down and say, hey, I would, I would love to have um, a conversation with you. And I think, you know, I wanna say, you know, there's something that's been bothering me and this is how I feel. I think when you approach a conversation with, I feel this way or how I feel, um, I think it helps to kind of take the, the pointer off of the other person that you're addressing the, the question to. But I think it's important that, you know, you sit down and have an open dialogue with someone um, and not that you're getting other, pe getting other people involved in the conversation, just to sit back and explain to them, like, I feel this way and, you know, this is what's happening. Um, and I would really like to, I, I'm not sure what the feedback is, but if they're trying to accomplish a goal for the division or, you know, for their unit or whatever. But I think it's important, like I said, just to sit down and have an open dialogue with and say, hey, can I discuss something with you and, and kind of approach it from that way. Um, Susan writes a comment too. She goes, on the feedback and performance reviews, I know from working with so many folks that the environment is very toxic for women in many retail environments. Men in supervisory positions who don't have much self-esteem use the opportunity to bully women. Any thoughts or advice? I really hate seeing so many young women with little to no self-esteem feeling so powerless. And I'll even take it a step further um, and ask you that, do these experiences, these first experiences when you're 16 years old working in retail impact you and your confidence for the rest of your life and your career? Well, I mean, I think I, I heard, um, you know, the other panelists speaking up about making sure you show up and making sure that you're confident and, and don't be, be afraid to address it. And, you know, I, I kind of think of, you know, maybe when I was younger and, you know, not feeling like I can really say something, but we all have an opportunity to really, you know, step up to the plate and really let someone know, you know, how we're feeling. I mean, if we don't do it, then we're going to continue to be walked over. And so I think it's an opportunity to push back. And I mean, I think she was talking about males and um, I don't know, like if it's, if it's a situation, I, I would. I would not let um, the fact that it's a male get in the way. I, I guess I'm just a very strong person, but you know, if it gets to a point where it's uncomfortable, then obviously you have HR that you can go to to address the question. But I think that you just have to head it head on and just have that you know direct conversation with the person. All right, let's pivot a bit. Let's talk about DEI in the workplace. Uh, another stat from leanin.org reports that employees on diverse and inclusive teams put in more effort, stay longer hours, and demonstrate more commitment. In addition to that, diverse teams are often more innovative, productive, and have greater profits. So Jamelisa, this question is for you. In your opinion, what can companies do, big and small, to create a more inclusive environment? 
Thank you, Genesis. Um, the one thing I would love to see is for individuals to, to really look into what DEI is as opposed to just using it as an acronym for their business for, you know, to fit in to make sure they're filling in the quota is understanding the fact that diverse voices, diverse cultures and experiences only enrich a team, only bring more productivity. And like you're saying, I mean, and, and I know we don't want to touch on statistics too much, but it's, it's the reality, you know, it is, it is proven. Many, um, many white led organizations or historically white led organizations only look at numbers. When in reality, we know we may not get all of our numbers counted, but our teams of two will be a lot more productive than any team of four or five when you only have one set of thought processes. You know, it's, it's being open to the fact that individuals have different experiences, come from different areas of the world. Like we were saying here, I'm sharing a space with three other beautiful women of color. And the reality is we all were shaking our heads as I was talking about the village living. We know that to be a fact in our cultures, we are expected to have our mothers by our side or our aunties or what, you know, whatever that person may be in, you know, in your life where you can just pick up the phone and call as opposed to that silo thinking. Same thing needs to happen in organizations, big and small, is understanding the fact that you have access to human capital. So why not invest in that? Why not ask the people of your business and the people in your community what they need from you, as opposed to assuming that based on numbers that someone came up with wherever they did it is really going to be the answer. In the Lehigh Valley, we're this beautiful melting pot. And yet when we look at these big organizations, we see the same face all the way throughout historically and even still today. So many individuals and many businesses are talking about how, yes, we have DEI and we have a department and we have such and such person that we hired to make sure that we are inclusive. But are you? You know, are you really? Are you truly making that commitment? And if you haven't yet, what is your plan for the next year for the next 18 months we want to see it when i say we i'm speaking on behalf of myself my community and every person of color in this area that wants to see themselves have the opportunity to be in those positions of leadership excuse me of leadership in these organizations personally i would love to see um you know a, a time for example like any position executive position has a max term of eight years for example and that's just throwing a number out there no one should be in the same position for 24 years while they just keep doing the same thing over and over. Their company doesn't actually invest in people and allow other people to have the opportunities to grow in that business. So in many ways, in many ways, um, organizations and businesses can truly tap into the beauty of the diversity that exists in the Lehigh Valley and surrounding areas. But the first thing is stepping aside and training someone else or mentoring someone else to move up into those positions and allowing us, our children and our future generations to look up and see themselves in those individuals that are leading big and small organizations. The pandemic has taken a toll on all aspects of life, including our mental health and Again, I would take it a step further and say most drastically our mental health. There are anxieties about work, finances, family, and health, and all of that can be consuming and draining um, and can impact the fire that fuels our work and the passion we feel in our bones, right? So Jasmine, what are your recommendations on how women can keep that passion alive in their own business and field of work under these circumstances? Um, that's a very great question, Genesis. I would definitely say, uh, we talked about it earlier, work-life balance. Um, what you put in is what you put in yourself and what you get, give out, you know? So I would definitely say take the moment um, to find the self-reservation for you. Um, I could say for myself, working for corporate America, I mean, everybody's story here on this panel is, is speaking to me and it's a testimony for where I have came from, just understanding that these women have, gone through it themselves and it makes me feel that you know I'm not alone and sometimes it can be very overwhelming trying to be a leader trying to develop your own business trying to juggle life in the midst of all of that but sometimes we need to find self-reservation and it wasn't uh, for me until this COVID took place that I really 
appreciated time to myself. It gave me that re regeneration that I needed to be re-energized to give back 100% of the, the, the thing that I love the most, which is making women feel good when they come to my salon, giving my employees that 100% that uh, great leadership and, and, and energy from me. Um, and I can't do that respectfully if you are, don't take that time just to re-energize. And I think as women, we don't do that enough. Um, and, and that's because, you know, just because of where we're at in this world, you know, we are every woman and that is a good thing but at times it can be very very challenging it can be daunting it can be stressful um but like we said we have to start relying on each other we start to have to rely on time and start taking that time out and regroup and regain and i think that helped me a lot to be where i'm at now with be skintiful going from the corner of uh, six and two and, and Allen to now on the West End. I couldn't do that if COVID didn't postpone my life. And at first I'm like, oh, I'm going to lose money. And I was, I, I didn't know if I was going to be able to keep my brick and mortar open, but I started getting into women empowerment books. I start to uh, do a little bit more spiritual investment and it, it allowed me to say, you know what, you got this. Like, like Lindsay said, show up. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to, when we get out of this pandemic, I'm going to show up. And I did that. I wasn't going to let this put me down and say, you know what, this is the time for me to throw in the towel. Because you get there where you're like, is this really for me? And you, it's okay to have those thoughts because that's the part that I needed through this challenge. And it, it allowed me to say, you know what, it is for me. And I'm going to show up. I'm going to put on my big girl draws. And I'm going to start taking time for myself, too, in the midst of it. And I'm doing that. So do yourself the, 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 the due diligence and give yourself time. And it's nothing to just, like you said, use others to give that, uh, that, that quality uh, time that you need to be able to be 100% and effective in whatever you want to do. Genesis, can I add something? I, I'm just like, I've always been like one of those strong women. Like I'm always like, I can do this. I can do this. And you know, that pandemic just hit me. And I was just like, oh my goodness, what is going on? I mean, I thought I was going to break. And so as strong as we are, you know, us women are, we need to understand when we need a break and we need that mental health and we need to step back and say, hey, you know, I, I need some help here because we are so used to forging forward no matter what. I got this. I got this. I got this. But again, you know, we need to take a break for ourselves sometimes and get the help that we need. That's all I want I to totally, say. Totally, totally relate to that. Um, I will jump in here and say when the pandemic started, I think a few weeks in, I said the same thing. I need something. So I took a painting and I told my husband, you take the baby for an hour um, after I finish work and I'm just gonna paint. And that was my me time to re-energize. So what do you guys do? I'm curious, what do you do, Lindsay, to kind of just re-energize? For me, my favorite thing in the world is to just sit back and listen to audiobooks. <laughs> Absolutely, just take in whatever information, learn from there and listen to podcasts as well. I love that. What about you, Lindsay? Sorry, y'all, it's nothing fancy. Uh, Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I got a Chinese food store that's really safe. They've been getting me through the pandemic, so I'll treat myself. They know my order by now. Um, and I've just started getting out and walking more. You know, I work from home, work, work, work. I have to remember, oh, I need sunshine. So just kind of walking and getting that sun in my face for a few minutes helps a lot. And it gets me away from the screen um, with the walking and even going out to grab some food. So I need that. I need to mentally check out from emails and follow up. So those have kind of been my go-tos. <laughs> yeah, I totally, totally get that. Um, you know, hindsight is 2020. I've said it. I'm sure many of you have said it as well. And we're not perfect, we make mistakes. It's part of the fabric of being a human being. But sometimes the fear of making a mistake can hold them in back from moving forward with a decision, whether it be starting a new business, relocating to another area for a better job, or even 
entering into politics. Women tend to be afraid of the unknown and fearful of making a mistake. So Lindsay, let me ask you this, how do you suggest we can move past that mentality and make the best decisions for ourselves and our families without being held back from deciding against potentially life-changing opportunities? That's a great question. And you know, after hearing everyone's feedback, feedback. I wonder if my initial answer had enough weight. So I think I'm gonna draw from what everyone shared. Um, still going back to being present and deciding that, uh, let me speak for me. I have to decide that Lindsay Watson is worthy of the effort and the work. And then once the effort and the work is taken place, I have to decide that Lindsay Watson is worthy of the opportunity that, that where those effort and works can be applied. Um, and sometimes that decision comes quickly and sometimes it's a process. So if I have to decide on Monday that I'm worthy of speaking with a prospect client and that they'll take my call and we'll have a positive conversation, then that's my decision. If I have to decide the next week that I'll, maybe I'll get business or we'll have another meeting, that's my decision. But it really starts from me making the decision. I personally have not found that I've just woken up one day and felt 100% confident and worthy and had the ability to completely black out all of the internal noise that says, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? But again, I, I almost feel like I'm foolish enough to keep showing up because I'm aware someone else is going to take that spot or that opportunity if I don't. So some of the ways that I've, I've been able to overcome, especially if I think about it, working on Wall Street, definitely being the only one, either the only woman or the only woman of color or the only almost six foot tall woman, you name it, okay? Um, I didn't have a whole lot of friends and I definitely didn't have a tribe, but I saw opportunity to grow and to learn. So at times where I kind of felt insecure, what I would do is talk with my bosses and ask them about something new to learn. I would ask to be part of meetings so I could just observe and absorb, right? I would ask for chances to try different things and make mistakes on their dollar right? I would do those things because one thing I could rely on was my work ethic. And I knew that's something that no one could take from me. And that there was no comment that could distract or dissuade that, right? I work and I work well, and I'm excellent at what I do. And I enjoy becoming better and better at it. So for me, there was a foundation there that was not dependent on how I felt or all of those thoughts screaming at me. And it helped. It helped me to grow, to grow, to grow to the point uh, of now where I am. So that would be my encouragement for everyone. There are certain foundational gifts and talents that you have that no one can take from you. If you continue to focus on growing those, your confidence will grow. And if you continue to take those steps, just deciding that you are worthy, even if it's day by day, your confidence will grow more and more and more to the point where you won't be consumed by fear or fear won't get in the way of you saying yes to a potential opportunity. Lindsay, I'm gonna stay with you. We have a question in the Q&A directed to you. Women don't tend to go for promotions as often as men do. Lindsay talked about valuing and quantifying what you bring. So what are your tips uh, to change our mindset to help women climb up the leadership ladder? Yeah, good question. I love it. Y'all are asking some really good questions. So one, decide what you want to do. Decide how far you want to go, okay? If you want that VP, EVP, if you want to eventually be a business owner, know what you want, first and foremost. When we talk to candidates, we'll always ask our candidates, no limits, no restrictions, take those off. What do you want? And candidates get a chance to express what they really want to do in life, right? So find that, one, make sure you have that in front of you. Two, I have a mentor. I am surrounded by people who have either succeeded uh, several steps above me or at least on the path. So being around positive people who can hold you accountable. I'm not talking about rah-rah, you can do it. You can get those. But specifically, if you want to grow, you need a, a team of people around you who can hold you accountable to your dreams and goals. Three, there's probably someone who's accomplished what you've done or gotten to that point. So looking for someone from the industry perspective who can help you prepare specifically as to how to ask within the industry you work in for that promotion, for that level up. Four, when we talk about quantifying your experience, I don't want you guys to walk away thinking you have to figure it out. Get help. 
okay? We're here, we're a staffing agency. You can reach out to us if you need coaching, if you need assistance, there may be some other resources, but don't think that you have to figure it out on your own. But it's so important to be able to see what your value is and then rehearse that over and over. So by the time you go to the meeting, you're the one setting the tone. I'll keep it short and sweet. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Um, let's talk about mentorship. We talked a lot about tribes and, you know, having that support system, but what about career mentorship? Um, you know, that can be a key driver of success, but unfortunately, um, there are women that often miss out on that. So I'd like to ask you, Deb, what has been your experience with mentorship? Have you had a mentor who has had a significant impact on your career path? So I, um, yes, I have. And I, I seek out those folks. Like, you know, if we're having any type of interactions or meetings and I observe someone and I say, oh, wow, they would be a great mentor. And I will take it upon myself to go to that person and just, you know, uh, explain to them that I really enjoyed the conversation and, you know, what they've done. And I would love to, um, for them to be my mentor. And, and I have done that on several occasions. I think it's really important to have a mentor. And I also think it's also important for us to be, be mentors to others. So I, I see it coming full circle. And, um, you know, they're not only the people at work that I work with, they're people in different organizations that I'm part of and just all over the place. So again, you know, mentorship is so important. You do need to have someone that you can go to and just kind of like, be able to throw things at them or ask for feedback uh, on your approach because you may not be able to do that in your situation at work. And so, you know, don't feel like you can only go to someone to get feedback at work. You've got those other folks that are outside your business unit or outside your organization that can provide direction to you. So leverage those people uh, to, to help you. What about you, Jamelisa? What has been your experience with mentorship and, you know, what would have been your ideal mentor as you were um, going through your career in your early in the early phase of it? Um, an ideal mentor will be someone that looks like me. Will be someone that I can see growing into and becoming. Um, and the reality is, I was blessed with having that as a child living in the Dominican Republic. Um, my aunt is a professor and um, a doctor in in the Dominican Republic, and it was beautiful to see how she was able to achieve that. You know, this is you're talking about 70s and 80s when it wasn't very common for females to hold positions like that. And then moving here, of course, living with my mom and seeing, I mean, she, if anyone knows her, Isa Pereira, she is hardworking. She will break through doors and windows and walls if, you know, if she has to, to, to make it to what, wherever her goals are. So I have had, I have had that. But as far as in careers, I'm a trendsetter when it comes in my family living here, you know, being not even first generation. I'm, I'm an immigrant myself. My children are first generation um, Dominican Americans here in, in the States and is knowing the difficulties that when I entered the, the workforce, there were no supervisors and bosses that looked like me. There were no men nor women of, of color in any of those positions. So I knew I had that homework. I had to take that on myself. And one of the things that I have been blessed with is amazing friends. Um, even though we have grown together, we have all been very, very focused on what our careers were going to be, what we wanted to achieve, what, you know, what Lindsay was saying, what is that goal? Like no barriers, you know, stop seeing the hurdles and, and look at the ultimate goal and just take that hurdle as another bump that you need to go over to, to keep moving. Um, so for me, aside from having my family, having close friends is then becoming that mentor for others is the importance of making myself available, you know, just like all of us, I think all of us have mentioned that is our willingness to help this next generation. And not because it's gonna, you know, it's not the future generation, they're the now generation, our children are living here now, so we cannot discard their contributions as they're existing in this moment in the world. Um, so it's just setting that example and allowing them to, yes, make mistakes, but also take them by the hand when they ask for that help. Awesome. This has been a really great discussion. We really talked about a lot, relationships, work-life balance, gender stereotypes, you name it. Women are multifaceted in so many different ways. 
I really enjoyed the conversation, but I want to close this discussion on a slightly different note. Um, I would like all of the panelists to answer this question. When we self-analyze and deconstruct who we are, it boils down to our individual life experiences, right? So, so here's the question that I have. Jasmine, I'll start with you. Who or what inspired you to become who you are today? And looking forward, and probably most important, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh, wow. That is a great loaded question. Um, <laughs> um, you know what? I would say what inspired me the most was where I come from, um, my, my, my background, my makeup. Uh, like Yamalisa said, you know, being the first generation in my family from Pontiac, Michigan, Metro Detroit, um, a very destitute, province-stricken, uh, small no opportunity type city, uh, but I rose above the occasion, seeing how hardworking my family was to pull themselves up to where they were to provide for me to get a great education. I took that with uh, with no, uh, I didn't take that, you know, for granted. I did it. And I want to show the appreciation of my blue collar working family and mother and father that, you know what, I appreciate you. So I would say it is, is to where I came from. It has motivated me to be successful, to rise above the occasion, to rise above the standard, to rise above all the stereotypes I could have been, all of the mistakes that I could have made that could make me not where I'm at today, but I use those mistakes to make them, you know, um, now accomplishments and to be able to now leave a, a, a hopefully a, 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 I guess a, what did you say? Some type of legacy that to be visionary, um, the, the legacy of, you know, you can start from small and you can grow and be a, a whatever you want to be. And I want to be the de definition of that whenever somebody says my name or ever hears a be skin to full house of glam and day spa that they know that, you know, with heart, sweat, and tears, that this was a place that was built off of love and for women of color, and that we have a place for ref refuge and beauty. And I, I hope that that's what I leave behind. Wonderful response. What about you, Lindsay? What would you say? Can you repeat the question? I got lost in Jasmine's answer. <laughs> oh, man. So, you know, what inspired you to be who you are today and what do you want your legacy to be? Okay, thanks. So like Jasmine, I, I believe, and it's my conviction that I stand on the shoulders of those before me. Um, I had the pleasure of winning the 40 Under 40 Award last year for Lehigh Valley. And uh, one of the questions was, you know, who, pretty much whose shoulders are you standing on? So my mom and my dad, um, their fight uh, to be successful in their own right during the civil rights area and their commitment to community service and helping others is ridiculous. I mean, just, right? So those examples there and my business partner and my mentor, Bill Brown, he's been my mentor for almost 20 years now um, and has put up with all the behind the scenes mess and insecurities and challenges throughout business um, and has really helped me um, in so many ways. And so I stand on their shoulders and I'm aware that it's my job to work as hard as I can to help open the doors for now, my niece and my nephew, my godson who are on, uh, who are standing on my shoulders or will be, right? And don't get me wrong, they're good in their own right, but um, I know that it's, it's my job and responsibility to make sure that doors that they can enter into, that they can enter into easier than me because that's what the people before me did. And that's very, very, very important for me. Um, and I, I think if I think about a legacy, what I really want is to be able to, one, not only help to open doors for the future, but also uh, be an example of what it's like to grow up in a community where no one looks like you and still make it and still be comfortable in your own skin and realize that sometimes being different is that value that you can offer. Um, because your perspective is just, it just comes from a, from a different place. Awesome. I love that, Lindsay. What about you, Deb? Okay, so um, 
I, I'm a, I'm a lot older than the other panelists here. Um, I grew up um, in a predominantly white environment where there were only five African Americans in our school. So um, there was a lot of prejudice um, around. And, you know, I was told that I couldn't do things. I wasn't ever going to be anything. And my job in life was to make everybody wrong that said that to me. And I just forged ahead. I mean, this like makes me want to cry, but um, it was just like, I wasn't going to let anybody stop me from being what I could be. And um, I just want people to know you know, believe in yourself. You can be what you want to be. And, and that's really just all I have to say. <laughs> I got a knot in my throat when you were saying <laughs> that. I love that, Deb. Um, and last but not least, John Lisa, what about you? Who inspires you to be who you are and what do you want your legacy to be? Um, I'm inspired every day by my community, my family, my children, um, my mother, uh, absolutely. Um, but the reality is, um, you know, Lindsay, Jasmine, Deb, you ladies are absolutely amazing. As I'm listening to Deb, I'm like getting chills because the reality is, is that, you know, we have been blessed to be, you know, brought into this world at this point in time where we have a lot more opportunities than those that came before us ever had. And for any of us to see that and not take advantage of that and break those barriers even further, excuse me, even further for the next generation, it will be a disservice to ourselves and to the world. Um, our duty, and, and again, you know, I'll go back to speaking to myself, my goal, my purpose is to invest in that human capital, is to break and interrupt that white-centered uh, mentality, that post-colonial world that we have always lived in. We haven't lived in any other world. We can speak about, you know, disrupting racism and white supremacy and whatever it may be. And these words can be uncomfortable to some, but the reality is they need to be said. It's the reality of this entire half of the world where we have grown up and been born into and if we don't do that intentionally it's not going to change um it's understanding the fact that yes our parents were told they couldn't be here we were told this panel would look very different five ten years ago had we you know and previous generations had not done the things that they have done so yes we are standing on the shoulders of those pioneers that have wrecked those standards and those lines that were drawn around us being told that this is the box that you fit in and that's all that you have we're drawing well beyond those lines and making new ones and allowing them to be squiggly for the next generation to wreck and redraw so my legacy would just be that is to understand that when you speak of equity and and humans it's understanding that we are all going to be different but we need to learn to respect those differences and actually take that opportunity to learn from other people and that's what i teach my children when i'm doing work through my through my foundation unidos i have them by my side writing you know postcards to mail to the children in you know in the areas that we service i have them come with me and deliver some of these gifts i have them collect toys that they haven't used for three months, put them in a bag and help me deliver them so they can see the smiles and the impact that they're making. So my work would just be that, is to invest in the beauty of what we have access to and inspire others to do the same wherever they exist in. Erica Watson put in the chat, in the chat, wreck and redraw, how powerful, wow, wow, wow. And I have to agree, you ladies, knocked it out of the park. This was an awesome conversation. I hope everyone listening also enjoyed it. And I'll leave you with this thing for everyone who's listening. What do you want your legacy to be on this International Women's Day? We've just heard from four incredible panelists and I hope this was thought provoking. Um, and so I will leave it with that and Azalea, you can take it away. Wow, I just wanna say, wow. Thank you to all the powerful women on this panel and Genesis, I have left with a lot of wisdom today, so thank you. I have Deb tearing me up and Lindsay telling me to be a go-getter. So just thank you everyone. Thank you, Emilisa, and thank you, Jasmine, for joining us today and just leaving us with all this wisdom. Um, thank you everyone who attended, and I hope you enjoy this beautiful, beautiful day for International Women's Day, and I hope you empower women all around you in your daily lives. Thank you.